Hello, beautiful friends. Welcome to the Art of Being Human podcast, where we dive into life's big questions. Questions like, how did I become the person that I am? What is the impact of the stories that I tell myself? How can I be a beneficial presence to the people around me? And my personal favorite, how do I live a spiritual life in a material world? And of course, so many more. So friends, I don't know about you, but I've spent a huge chunk of my life thinking that my body and my mind were two completely separate things and that my spirit or my soul, well, don't even get me started. I assumed that my spirit or soul simply held disdain for this earthly vessel that I had. I had no idea that what was going on in my mind deeply affected my body and that what was happening in my body deeply affected my mind and that my soul slash spirit was also intimately connected to all of that. And I'm so grateful because today's guest is someone who truly has a radical understanding of all of this. She has given her life to walk with people as they journey towards oneness, towards love and respect for all the different parts of themselves. Dr. Gail Randall is a physician. She's a scientist. She's a medicine woman. She's an administrator, an educator, and a writer who's been doing this work for more than 40 years. And the truth is, Dr. Gail, your list of accomplishments and achievements is so so incredibly long and so incredibly mind-blowing that the gift you have been to this world just by being you and by being dedicated and committed to this work is just, is truly inspiring to those of us who have a knowledge about it. And you also host the Soul Sisters, a Soul Story podcast, my apologies, Soul Story podcast, which everyone should go listen to. And you have a book coming out for pre-order in March called Soul Doctoring, Heal Yourself, Heal the Planet. And I don't think you could have come up with a better title. I think that's pretty much the most perfect title. So Dr. Gail, welcome. I'm so excited to have you on as a guest today. Oh, I'm just delighted to be here. Thank you, Meg. Absolutely. So here's the interesting thing. I get to meet you now being the person that you are now, but this isn't how you started. (laughs) You, you have gone through this incredible journey of creating this person you are today. And I'm so, so curious about your journey, about how you came to love this work and how you even came to be interested in this work. Yeah. I mean, I guess I, it's from birth. Mm. I actually had a near-death experience when I was born. Oh, my goodness. And I saw, I guess you would call them angels. Um, they, I called them the kind ones in my mind when I saw them. And they, they were so kind and it was so beautiful because I was in a lot of pain. So I left my body and I was with them for a while. And then they told me, no, I needed to go back because... I mean, I didn't even realize back where, I mean, aren't I where I'm supposed to be? <laughs> and they said, you, you have a purpose. Wow. And, you know, part, you know, your purpose is to help all of us and, and all mankind. And so I, I was born with a purpose That's and, a- and, a, and a knowing of spirit and an understanding there's more than here. So you know, it wasn't something I had, I had to quest on how to fill all that in, you know, because there's a huge differential between being an infant and a grown up woman. But yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's fascinating, right? Like immediately when you start your story, it's just so simply fascinating. And I'm curious, did you carry this knowledge in you from when you were young on when you were three four five six did you already know this or is this something that as you began to grow and mature that you went oh I remember this experience no it was I had a certain confidence Mm. because I I already knew what was beyond and what what could be so I, I think that gave me a certain confidence in my life Not that I didn't have the insecurities of the teenage girl and things like that. Everybody had. (laughs) Oh, shoot. I was going to, I was hoping you were going to tell me that cured all that. It just left. (laughs) (laughs) No, I still had to do the work. (laughs) I had to do the work, but just knowing that and knowing, you know, and then I had other opportunities to see beyond this reality, you know, um, with my, with my brother that crossed over. And even before that, I, 
I was able, I was privileged to be invited to some American Indian uh, ceremonies where I had visions. And so, you know, I, I was conscious of that all along. And I was also conscious that people needed help, mm. you know, because I'm very observant from the very beginning and that the, the connections between people's healing and planetary healing is something that, you know, all of us really need to understand better. If we heal ourselves, you know, in, in a lot of the ways I'd like to suggest people do, it helps the planet. So Mm -hmm. I I say, what's good for us is good for the planet. What's good for the planet is good for us. And um, it's a connection. It's, it's connections that people need to make to understand that because I don't know if you saw that movie, don't look up. I did. I did. Uh, yeah. I mean, <laughs> yes. uh, funny guy's name's Dr. Randall, right? And so, <laughs> you know, I sometimes I feel like Dr. Randall because I'm telling people, look, look you know, it's, we yeah. need to, the comet's coming. It's yeah. not a comet, but it is the worst crisis that we've ever faced as a humanity and as a planet is coming. And we can, if we make small changes, this is my whole thing we can make small changes Mm. in our own lives that heal us that's also going to help our planet yeah because the planet is really sensitive she's way more sensitive than we ever knew and we can look back at COVID 2020 when we all backed out and see what happened to the planet (sighs) it healed all globally you name it you name a species that was going extinct it came back yeah. You know, the flamingos returned to Mumbai. The the Himalayas were were visualized by people that had never even, you know, seen them in their whole lifetimes. You know, the fish came back to the canals in Venice. They became crystal clear. All of these miracles, you know, because we backed out. And so we can, in various small ways, one of the biggest ways I think we can help is begin to change our food system. Now, we're not going to be able to be the bureaucracy people, to, but what we can do is vote with our dollar. What we can do is choose organic. What we can do is choose plant-based. And all of these things add up. So I say small steps for humankind make great changes for our planet because she's very sensitive. Yeah. Yeah. I I love I love that because I think and you can correct me if I'm wrong and you can tell me if you see flaws in my thinking but I think that for many of us we look at whoever's in charge so to speak and we say fix it fix mm-hmm. it fix it and yeah, I think they'll it, fix it science they'll fix it. it right someone should do something mm-hmm. <laughs> Seems to someone be a- should and guess what <laughs> it's us Exactly. Exactly. And I think it's such an interesting thing because um, like when we're children, like let's say we're babies, right? We have a sensation in our body and someone comes to fix it. We're, we're hungry. So we have this explosion in our stomach of hunger and someone comes and gives us food. And so we get this idea that someone out there should do something. Mm-hmm. And we forget that the growing up process is taking responsibility. Right. The growing up process is saying, ah, now I am aware of my own sensations and I know what to do about them. Mm-hmm. Right. And so this idea of going, you know, I have anxiety about the future. I have anxiety about where our planet is going. Wait, who should do something? Mm-hmm. Oh, me. I'm the one now in charge. So I, I really respect that you put that onus on the individual and on communities and not just look for someone to come in and, and mm-hmm. you know, magically do something. Yeah. Well, see, I want to make it not an onus. Mm. I want to make it where we make choices that make us feel good about mm. ourselves yeah. and good because we're helping the planet. Yeah. So I, I want to make it a positive thing. Yeah. And yes, they should do something too. And they, and I do believe climate scientists are, are, you know, they're trying. It's not like they're not doing stuff. But, you know, what really is going to take a critical mass of us little individuals. Yeah. It, it's I, not, I don't think we're going to get everybody. But if we get a critical mass, I call it, we're all pointing our sacred arrow in the same 
direction or in at least in a sacred direction, yeah. it makes a difference. But we yeah. also need to honor the diversity of all of us, you know, but I try to get people to understand it doesn't matter what color we are. It doesn't matter what gender we are. It doesn't matter what ethnic group we belong to or what country we're in or any of that diversity brings unity, unity through diversity. If we can Mm -hmm. have respect for that diversity, it's just the, the sacred arrow or that we're all part of humanity that we have in common. We need to just, you know, recognize that and go, yeah, that's true. We're all yeah. part of one humanity, one planet. And if we can get that critical mass, things begin to change all by themselves. It's pretty amazing. And they've, they've measured these changes. Yeah. yeah you know, and, and I think that that's such an encouraging thing because it's a little bit like um, um, this idea of when, when is that tipping point where we go, ah, enough people are doing this, right? And so Mm -hmm. instead of going, well, I'm just one person. So what if I'm recycling? You know, I'm just one person. So what if I'm buying organic or, you know, whatever? Um, It's like, no, you might be that tipping point. You You may be the push that makes us go, oh, we're seeing significant change. So I love that. And I'd be really curious about something else. I'm really interested in this because in our society, and and we're doing this in in North America. We're do, you're in you're in California. I'm in Vancouver, Canada. Um, we live here in our area in a very individualistic society where we mm-hmm. very much think about my ourselves as an individual, and we live in this day and age where everything is about feel good, feel good, feel good, feel good. So. I don't want to do that. You know, it doesn't, it doesn't feel good. I I don't want to, I don't want to recycle. It's too much work. I don't want to, you know, care about that. It doesn't make me feel good. It doesn't whatever. Um, And I feel like there's a, a, a lack of a shared sense of responsibility and that that shared sense of responsibility is positive, not negative. And so I'm really curious when you look, if you agree with me, you may not agree with me. And I, I, if you don't, I'd love to be challenged on it. But if you look at the the value system that our society has of the individual and only doing things that feel good, et cetera, et cetera, do you see that as a negative influence on how we're taking care of our planet? Or do you think differently? I, I have a completely different perspective on it. No, I totally get what you're saying. And I told, uh, you know, it's it's estimated that 98% of people are disengaged from this subject, but I think it's, it's actually reducing, but it's, it's really about, I'm trying to teach people and I think they're beginning to get it. And there's a guy named um, Hawkins who wrote a book called Regeneration. And he teaches from a, a positive aspect too, like I do, that this doesn't have to be a negative thing. As a matter of fact, I'm, if you, I, I tell people, wake up in the morning, and then just like John Cabot Zinn taught, mind or still does teach mindfulness. It's a type of mindfulness. Mm. So you're living on planet Earth. When you wake up in the morning, be cognizant of the fact that you live on this living being called Earth, and have that at your heart. Have regeneration of the earth at your heart and even that feeling can help her. But if you have that at your heart, every choice you make in your day or in your life has her at the center. So you won't want to buy single use plastics. You won't want to, you know, not recycle because you have that at your heart Mm. and you'll make the right choices because of it. And that is going to be better for your personal health. Mm-hmm. And that is going to be better for the health of the planet. I, I think that's beautiful. And I think like carving out that space to remember is so important. One thing we do as a family, I have a, my husband and I've been together for 22 years. We have two teenage sons. One of the things we do as a family is when we eat, before we eat, we pause and we say, can we acknowledge that something had to die so that we can live? Mm -hmm. Right. And just that acknowledgement and you begin to view your food differently then Mm -hmm, it's mm -hmm. not just, I'll just throw this burger in my mouth quickly to nourish myself so that I can go on and rush off on the rest of my day. But it's literally looking at whatever's in your plate and going, this came from somewhere, this experienced, this is, this is life giving. And Mm -hmm. if you look at your plate, is that food life giving? 
or is that food that's just full of things that are actually depleting you of your resources and of your energy, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I, I love that, like kind of including that mindfulness of the fact yeah. that that is something sacred. Now I have another question for you. And I'm well, curious. I just add one thing. I want oh, to yes, add to that because my American Indian teachers always taught me to give thanks for all of the animals and plants and things that laid mm-hmm. down their lives so that we could live. Cause that yeah. was the original agreement between man and the animals and plants and things. And so they're the original regenerative, mm. you know, farmers, regenerative medicine makers and everything else. I mean, their, their very way they live is regenerative. So I just, I just yeah, to- no, that's beautiful. I love that. I love that, that expansion of um, really just including, including that, Con- contract isn't the right word agreement. I like agreement better. Like including the gratitude for that larger agreement is, is such a beautiful reminder. So I'd be really curious. There are people who are going to be listening to this podcast who will say, I live in a food desert. Like this all sounds lovely. I wish I could, but I'm living in an area where the closest thing I have is a convenience store to me. Um, I haven't seen a fresh vegetable in forever. I, I, I would have to go long distances in order to find something like that. In what way can we, ch- I mean, change that seems like such a silly question, but what can we do about that? Because all of this sounds like, yes, this is an aspirational way of living, but for some people, this isn't even close to a reality. Like this idea of living this way is so far from what their real world looks like. In what ways can we assist or make change or in what ways could they do small things that could still take them towards that living? No, I think they can. I think they can make small, anybody can. Mm. Even if you, are you talking about impoverished? Yeah. 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 You know, and that's true. And there are people definitely in certain parts of the planet, they don't have water, let alone food. So, you know, it there there are organizations and we're, you know, that are addressing that. And uh, Hawkins' book, you know, attributes some of the efforts that they do to those populations. So, but we need to do whatever we can do so we can help them. Mm. Because otherwise, we're, the more we don't help them, it increase, increases the desertification of the land. It increases the impoverished individuals. And if we take care of what we have, we're, we're going to have less of that damage, less deforestation, all of that, which is what goes with our current food system. But if we make choices, I call it vote with your dollar, buy organic food, buy regenerative food. It's going to be less deforestation, less desertification, and it's going to affect people all over the planet. Mm. It's it's not it's not as local as you think. These effects are global. Yeah, yeah, and and I think that's something that often is missing in our thinking, right? And and I noticed this um, even even with COVID. I noticed this idea of now that it's happening to me, I'm really upset. But there's an, there's an unawareness that this is happening in other countries all the time. Yeah. And there is no solution or not that there's no solution, but for those people, they feel like there's no solution. And that there's this idea of all I want is for this problem to go away for me mm-hmm. instead of, I want this problem to go away for all of humanity. Like my husband and I were talking about it and we said, you know, if COVID left Canada, we would all go back to our normal lives. And we would never think about the fact that there are diseases that remain in countries and they still have to deal with things like this. Maybe it's not COVID, but it's something else. And Mm -hmm. we would just go, oh, isn't that nice? COVID is over. And so I love what you're talking about when you talk about this idea of taking a moment to recognize that your actions, whatever you're consuming, whatever you're purchasing, whatever you're bringing into your life, it isn't just about you, but that it has this global effect. And that every time you bring home fast fashion, (laughs) which is my personal pet peeve, every single time you bring home a plastic and then just throw it out as if there's like just 
oh, I, we throw it out. And I love this idea of we could send, send our garbage into space now is this new idea that's out there. And I'm just like, oh, space is going to have our garbage now. Like, this is just so terrible. But this idea of it, it doesn't affect anyone but me, um, I think is an idea that not only needs to be challenged, but needs to be confronted constantly so that we realize we are a humanity, that there's this oneness in mm-hmm. us and, and that what we do affects other people. Yes, but I, I see, I like to honor the me generating. Mm. I like to honor the self-healing because I think through self-healing, if we really self-heal in the ways that I suggest, you're going to start making those connections. I mean, even integrative medicine makes people make connections. Oh, there's different disciplines. Oh, there's different cultures. And then they begin to look around themselves and see the greater connection between health and the planet yeah and that's where it's at so i i think there's a connection between moving through the me you know healing me and then making me so i see the bigger picture i love that i love that okay so that's very exciting to me and i would love to dive into that i would love to dive into in your worldview as you have seen people come through your life as you have helped people through this journey what is, what, do you see a pattern of people that come to you? Where, where would you say, and I'm not, I'm probably not going to use the right languaging. So hopefully, you know, you can, hopefully you can just see past my very, you know, rudimentary kind of languaging here, but where do you feel people come? Where does their sickness reside for a lack of a better way of saying it? And what is their process to healing self? And what does it look like when you come out the other end of all of that? Mm -hmm. Well, everybody has their own path. Mm-hmm. to get there right so some people they'll come in and they'll talk with me once and boom you know I mean they're there before they leave <laughs> so you know and other people it'll take a very long time but mm-hmm. it, it's about making the connections mm-hmm. that I refer to the inner connections between health and the greater picture so it's not all just about you so you you end up looking outside yourself when you get well enough you know to do so yeah, and that's, that's what lifts you up. But yeah, but there I, are some, you know, there are people with traumas and deep seated things. I, I use the metaphor of the iceberg because what you see on the above the water is just exactly that, just the tip. That's why they say just the tip of the iceberg because mm-hmm. where these illnesses, or if you want to call them diseases or whatever, are buried beneath the water. And until you address them, they're going to rule you and they can turn into dis-ease, a bigger deal. You know, first it's just maybe energetic. And that's why I like to clean the energy first too, because clear the pathway. So the, the dis-ease, if you will, can have a way out, but first, you know, you, you got to address it's there and, and own it. And instead of like, we like to cover up, our wounds. No, don't touch me there. No, you don't see that. Yeah. Well, everybody sees it, but you're trying to cover it up. <laughs> what we need to do is uh, let the love in the light and that's what heals it. So first you, you, you identify it. Then you say, yep, that's mine. I take responsibility for it. And then you integrate it. Mm. And you, there's a gift there in every illness. There's a gift. Yeah. There's something that you can learn. And when you learn it, you, you free yourself. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I, I so, I so love that. And it's been a hard lesson for me um, to learn throughout life. I will be honest. I, I tend to be the type of person that says, <laughs> and I'm sure everyone says this, but 
I, I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this is on repeat when I'm in a situation mm-hmm. where I'm having a health issue, or maybe something has come into my life that is unpleasant. I don't like, doesn't make me feel good. And God forbid, you know, it, it hits my triggers <laughs> or my wounds <laughs> and all, th- my brain just screams. I don't want this. I don't want this. I don't want this. But then you're just attracting it more to you. 100%. And it's been, <laughs> it's been a lifelong journey to go, <laughs> ah, just relax into it. Just relax into it. And that the first step is like you said, acknowledging it and going, no, this is here and this is my teacher. This is mm-hmm. here and this is my teacher. And so it's quite funny because um, as my husband and I were really trying to integrate this way of living into our lives, we would have someone come into our life that would be very frustrating. And we would look at each other and go, this is our teacher. This uh-huh. is our teacher. And we'd look at each other like, stop saying that. This isn't my teacher. I just want this person gone. And we'd be like, no, no, no. Okay. This is my teacher. Or if a, a health issue would come up and, you know, we would look at each other and just be like, remember, this is your teacher. And I would just mm-hmm. be like, oh, I don't want this teacher. Um, but the funny thing is, and I don't know if this is your experience or, 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 or if, um, you know, most people have this experience after a while, but the funniest thing is that after a while, it's amazing when these things come into your life, that the concept of, ah, this is my teacher comes so quickly that so much of, you still feel the negative feelings. I'm not going to say that they're gone, but they lose their power. Mm -hmm. And that's a fascinating way to walk through the world. Mm -hmm. That the power of those emotions, that resistance is gone. It may still bubble up. It may still be there. Uh, You may still feel it, but that you so quickly see it as a teacher, Um, Mm -hmm. which I mean, I'm talking like I got this down pat. Most certainly do not. (laughs) Most certainly do not folks, if you want to know the truth. Um, But when you can do it, it's amazing how your experience of life changes. Well, being aware of it is the number one thing. You know, you're, you're halfway there. Yeah. It's like, you know, this is my teacher. And then you have to unwind that. How is this my teacher? Mm. What is the metaphor? You mm. know, I, I like to look at illness as a metaphor. My teacher, Joseph Real, saw actually the Picri Pueblo people saw all of life as a, even their language is metaphoric. It's interesting. You know, so, you know, like sweeping, you know, it sounds like sweeping, you know, and it's, it's so interesting because all of life is a metaphor. So for instance, I, I, I have a sore left foot right now. I'm talking to you and I'm going to go to the urgent care after we're done. <laughs> I oh, know no. all of my foot. Oh, I'm going to be a I don't mind sharing. So what this left foot has come to mean to me is trust. Mm. Your feet are about your placement and your left foot is about your spiritual placement. And I'm coming up on a big time in my life. And I was thinking, oh, should I sell my house? Do I need to do this or that? No, you need to stay right where you are and trust. Wow. That you're just exactly in the right place. Oh, that gives me shivers. One, I'm so sorry it hurts. I feel terrible. Your I feel like I just... is your is is sacred, you know. Mm-hmm. And so I've come to that realization. I'm embracing it. So I'm going to go get an x-ray. Yes, go do that too. Oh, I'm so, I I feel terrible that it's in pain. Now here's a question for you because I guess you were knowing that makes it not hurt. Yeah. Just acknowledging it. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's such a funny thing. Um, I, I, I have migraines and, um, if I don't say anything, it's like they're worse. It's like Mm. I'm this huge head that walks around. And then as soon as I'll say to my husband, my head hurts, it's almost like, Not that it goes away, but just like, I feel that release, but here's a question for you. So you have this pain in your foot, which again, I'm so sorry that you're experiencing that right now. And you're, you can connect it with something. You have that knowledge, that intuition, that, that wisdom that allows you to connect it. If you're someone who's going, okay, that sounds very cool. I wish I knew what my body was telling me. I wish I knew the metaphor it was trying to express to me. I haven't got a hot clue how to do this. I mean, if my finger hurts, what's my finger trying to tell me, (laughs) right? If someone is very new to this, how did you learn to incorporate this in your, 
in the way that you, the way that you look at things. And I know that's a very big question because you're extremely Mm -hmm. well educated. You're extremely, you've given your life to this, but as someone who's maybe starting, what would a, Mm -hmm. what would a way of doing it be? Well, there are people that, that know, so you might want to talk to one of those people, you know, that know (laughs) these things, but also there are, there are books on it. I think Louise Hay talks about body parts and what they mean and, you know, if you have issues here and there, you know, so there are ways of finding these things out. So the other thing, of course, I'm, I, I'm a spectrum. So I like to look at the very big, Mm -hmm. but I also like to look at the very small, Mm -hmm. like what's the root cause, you know, apart from the fact, okay, we were talking about my spiritual placement and okay, I get it, but what's actually wrong physiologically, Mm. you know, so what's the root cause on a anatomical or even a molecular level, you know? So, you know, those things are important to understand too. Mm. So if I'm, if I'm interpreting that in my language, there's like, yes, there's the spiritual side, but there's the physical side too. So go to the doctor (laughs) (laughs) because it's very interesting. Um, it's very interesting because I I come from a, a traditionally Christian background, very conservative background or whatever. And there's always this idea of praying for healing, praying for healing, praying for healing, but do, do hold your doctor appointment. Like do, do go to the doctor, you know? Right. And, and, um, and I mean, I've left that kind of lifestyle behind, but um, you know, there was this idea that these people, there's people in the community, in the Christian community that will say, um, Oh no, don't go to the doctor. Just wait for the healing. Just, just wait for the healing. And unfortunately there's been very sad instances where people have passed away or, you know, something really terrible has happened because they didn't have the big and small picture. Right. right? And so I love the fact that you include that. Um, Cause I think that that's, that's massively important. You can, you can do all the thinking that you want or all the, the spiritual work that you want, but do also go to get an x-ray. <laughs> I love that. And I have to tell you um, the first person that we go to when we have something is our little, um, Oh, I always pronounce her name wrong. Louise Hayes. Is that her name? Louise yeah. Hayes. Mm-hmm. Uh, we always go to her book first. We're always like, well, let's see what this says. Your migraine yeah. means your... <laughs> so mm-hmm. that's always the first thing we go to too. Now, one of the things that's been, it seems like very, very influential is your relationship with the First Nations people and the way that they look at the world. And so I'm really curious, what attracted you to that way of looking at the world and what what is it that you found that that um, worldview and that that level of spirituality and metaphor and all that kind of stuff mm-hmm. has really assisted you with. Yeah. Well, I've, I've always been a nature girl. Mm. You know, I actually used to, I, I'm from Nebraska and I remember running out the back door, hearing it slam and running into the cornfields when I was just a little kid and lying between the corn rows Mm. and watching such blue sky watching the corn sway in the wind and that to me was so calming and later I found out from my teacher that the swaying the word in T is elo 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 I mean that's just calming to hear about it isn't it but Uh that's how you move if you if you're stuck you alo out of it. <laughs> so alo, alo. And then on more than one occasion, this being would come to me and she was sparkly and had white hair like corn silk. And she had what I would call regalia, but I didn't even know what regalia was, but it was made out of plants. And she would tell, she was, she would look at me and she would say, it's all right. Mm. You know, you're on the right path. Everything's going to be all right. And so when I told my teachers later, they said, oh, that's the corn maiden would come to me. And so I didn't really go and seek it out. It came to me. Mm. I think that's beautiful. And, And it leads me to this it leads me in a way almost to a sense of sadness 
because there's so much beauty in what you're saying and it's so lovely and it's so flowing with nature and the universe and the spirits. And I think that's such a beautiful thing. Now, many of us, if we would have had a similar experience, we dismiss it. We dismiss, oh, that was my imagination. That that was just something I said to myself in my head. That was a child playing. Um, but you didn't dismiss it. You held them in your heart as beautiful gifts. And that, that's my languaging. You may use different languaging for that. But I'm curious, was that um, a conscious choice in you to say, I will not dismiss this? Or was that not even a, a possibility? And what do you say to people who go, oh, that sounds like just, that sounds silly. That doesn't happen. There's no such thing. You know, mm. those people that kind of block themselves off from that. Yeah. Well, you know, children see auras up until the time they're about three or four. And then they're told, you don't see that. Mm. And they stop seeing it. When I was little, I could, I still can at times hear what people are thinking. And I remember telling my father, oh, so-and-so is thinking this about so-and-so. And he said, what? He goes, you're a liar. And I said, no, I'm not lying, daddy. He goes, you go to your room and you stay there. No dinner. And you can tell me tomorrow morning when you figure out what lying is. Oh. So I went to my room, and instead of extinguishing the behavior, what I came up with was lying was telling people things they didn't want to hear. <laughs> <laughs> and when I came out the next day, was, did you figure out what lying was? I said, yeah, I did, Daddy. He said, good. He didn't ask me, thank goodness, what I figured out. So, But I understood from the time I was born, honestly, the first the first feeling I can remember having was compassion for my parents. Because I, like I said, I was, I don't know if I told you why I, I was born really early. I was born, mm -hmm. I was supposed to be born on June 15th and I was born on April 29th. And for mm -hmm. that day and age, that was quite early. Yeah. And I weighed only um, three pounds and I lost weight. Oh. And they gave me like less than a 50% chance of making it even after that near death thing. And so um, to me, I, I was very acutely aware of, of, like I said, spirit from the time I was born. And I felt because my father was part of the reason I was born too early. Mm. I didn't actually realize it in in retrospect but I remember the occurrence and he this is sort of maybe oversharing but he came home and he had sex with my mom mm. and my mom didn't want to oh. and you know sperm causes cervical I don't know if you know about that but it, it can cause the cervix to erode and then, as a matter of fact sometimes they suggest that well, I was going to say, I remember when I was pregnant with my son and he was, we we're getting close to the due date and the doctor right. was like, well, wink, wink, you know what you can yeah, yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> but it wasn't, this was not wink, wink, it was too soon. And so, mm -hmm. um, but I, when I was born, I, I, I said, well, they, they didn't know what they were doing. Mm -hmm. So I had compassion for them. Yeah. That's the first thing I felt. Wow. So this attunement to spirit was not supported is my no. assumption when you were young. No. Hmm. That must've felt, well, I mean, I'm going to make an assumption. <laughs> this is an assumption, Gail. Yeah. That must've felt lonely in a way, maybe, or, or was maybe, it such a, maybe beautiful... it was another gift mm. because it seemed like that was sort of my path. Like when I, of course, this is many, many, many years later, but when I chose to go to medical school, my father said, I'm not going to help you. Mm. And he had helped my brother become a lawyer. He helped every other kid. There's four of us do whatever they wanted to do, but he wasn't, he wasn't going to even help me with college, mm. but me helping myself 
made me very smart and made me very self-sufficient, which was something I needed in my life. Yeah. So, you know, even at the time it was like, well, but, um, you know, I forgave him and I realized the value in what I had gained. That's he was beautiful. sure proud when I graduated. Ah, they <laughs> are, aren't they? <laughs> do you, and if this is too personal, please just, just tell me, um, do you know why he helped others instead of you? Was there? Well, was it's, it hard, a, it's very hard to understand the workings of someone and all their injuries and things like that. But I felt, um, in retrospect, that perhaps he thought I needed discipline Mm. because I was very, I was a very spiritual child. Yeah. You know, I would go run around the neighborhood and tie willow branches on my tail. And I would literally run with the horses and live with the horses and eat grass with the horses and, Mm. you know, and we're always uncomfortable with what we don't understand, right? And we feel like we want to bring it under our control then. Um, and so that's fascinating. I, I, there's there's a, a part of me that can somewhat relate to that. I grew up in a, uh, I say this in the most loving way. And, and if my family's listening, this may not be the way you see yourselves, but this is the way <laughs> I see it. Um, I grew up in a very uh, capitalist kind of um, environment, a very highly motivated environment where it was like, you know, make something of yourself, make something of yourself, make something of yourself. And I was sort of that oddball out in my family where I was more like build relationships, have fun, sit and drink tea and read a book, you know? And I remember my brothers when I turned 18, sitting down with me and going like, oh, Meg, you got to do something with your life, girl. And I was like, I am. I am. I'm 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 reading and drinking tea and going for walks and I'm, you know, building connections with these other beautiful like I, this is what I'm doing and they're like no, 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 no. We mean go get a job. <laughs> and it was I so I felt very um very outside of my family and 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 there I was always kind of annoyingly bringing up you know, but you have to love people, but you have to love people and they did. My my family is an incredibly loving family. They adore helping, you know, the underdog or or anyone who's struggling. My family will give you the shirt off their back. But annoyingly, I I kind of kept pulling at this idea of um we should be doing more. We should be doing more. Um and and it also I think made me feel someone out, outside of that. And I know what that feels like to have strong arms try to corral you into a way of mm-hmm. thinking that doesn't feel natural to you. And you kind of have to ex- escape that almost in a way to go be yourself somewhere else. At least that was my experience. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It's a fascinating thing. Our family of origin. <laughs> so yeah, I think I made my space within my space. Mm. which is something I still teach people today. Mm, Tell me more about that. That sounds fascinating. Well, you can't always, you know, just like the people you were, you know, talking about impoverished areas can't find a vegetable, but, you know, if you're in a certain place where you're not allowed to do what is your path, you can, Mm -hmm. you still can. You Mm -hmm. just have to do it in your, in your own way in your own space so I tell people make your space within your space so you can still be the spiritual being that you want to express but maybe you can't totally express it to that person (laughs) you know which is it's not lying it's just preserving who you are Mm. yeah I I understand that do you find do you find that that it can be fulfilling enough for people? Well, it gets you through to where mm. you you can, you know, to yeah. then you're on your own, you can express in whatever yeah. way you want to. And yeah, look, yeah. I ran around the neighborhood with willow branches tied around my way. So I think I was expressing myself. Oh, know. I bet you were adorable. <laughs> I bet the neighbors were like, there she goes again. Mm. <laughs> that adorable mm. neighbor girl. <laughs> Um, so question for you. I mean, it's obvious every time I talk to you, it's whether it's, it's for longer or shorter periods that there is so much wisdom in you. There's so much inside of you that really a person could talk for hours and still not get 
even close to the bottom of the well. But if someone is listening to this and goes, oh, the way she talks, her energy, the space she holds, I need more of that in my life. How can people get a hold of you? How can they connect with you? And what things do you have that you can offer people um, that are that are on that journey and are honestly mm-hmm. looking for someone exactly like you? Well, many, many ways I try to share things with people. You mentioned earlier, I have a podcast called Soul Stories, which also came to me in a vision because it, it, one of the things I've been most interested in all along in my life is to raise consciousness. Mm. And I, it came to me, if, if I have people on that, are, that have done something unique that are conscious and they tell their soul story, it's going to raise the consciousness of the people listening. So, yeah. so we have that. And then um, my book you mentioned is coming out uh, pre-sales in March. So get ready to dial Amazon or click on there. Um, it's called Soul Doctoring, Heal Yourself, Heal the Planet. And it's about my journey. It starts out, it's a sort of a semi-autobiographical journey to start with. And then kind of takes people with me into and through into, you know, what, how I see medicine, because I'm also a a medical futurist and, you know, how, you know, self-healing could make the connections that we were talking about earlier. And then it uh, ends by talking about how we can make these changes on the planet and what we're facing right now and what we can do about it. That's so you can learn a lot by reading that book. I, I can imagine. And I'm looking forward to it. And you have a website. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, yeah. yeah you, I, what is it? What's, what's the way that they can get a hold of you on your Just website? Go on drgmrandall.com. Fantastic. Or call the office and ask to talk to me. 818-591-7600. And I have a full practice and you know, we do, I'm an integrative, I'm a functional medicine doctor, and I practice many different, actually 20 different modalities, but you don't really know it when you come and see me, it just kind of takes shape, whatever it is you need, comes up. I think that's so beautiful. I think that's such a beautiful gift. Um, because it really allows you the opportunity to help that person in whichever way they need it, right? Because you have the resources. And I think that that's such a lovely thing. Honestly, I have so appreciated this conversation. I have so appreciated you. I adore knowing that you're out there in California doing good work and and really being an advocate for a different way of living, a beautiful, integrated um, communal way of living. I think that's just absolutely lovely. So thank you for being my guest today. Thank you for the work that you do. I just, I so appreciate you. And thank you for what you do. You just uh, a lovely hostess and you ask all the right questions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. I, I'm going to, I'm going to keep that in mind. Cause um, yeah, you know, it's such an interesting thing. I'm always, I'm always fascinated. So sometimes I think, Oh, I, I should, I should really just kind of dig into even better questions um, because I really am always just so darn curious. <laughs> So thank you for your kindness. Thank you for your kind words. Listeners, thank you for spending this time with us. As you know, I love you and appreciate each and every one of you. And until next time, take good care. Bye-bye.